an introduction to the archaeology of architecture. Again, my name is Sarah and I'm going to be your mentor throughout this course. First of all, I really want to thank you for enrolling. Uh, I'm really excited to learn with you. Second of all, if you have any questions or uh, require any clarification regarding any of the course material, please reach out to me via Google Classroom. And don't forget about the orientation tab underneath you'll find FAQs and practical tips. Uh, I'll make myself as available as possible throughout the duration of this course, but obviously with issues uh, such as time zones especially, uh, I may not be able to respond to you as quickly as I would like, but I will respond in good time. Uh, I'll do my very best anyways. So welcome to week one. Uh, let's get right into it. So what is archaeology? Uh, as this is an introductory course, I wanted to go over some basic concepts associated with archaeology before we get into the specifics regarding architecture. I apologize if this is redundant for anyone uh, who's taking archaeology, maybe in school or something like that, uh, but I think it's important just to kind of go over these concepts going forward, maybe consider it a refresher of some kind uh, before we get into, you know, architecture as a branch. I just want to go over, you know, the tree that is archaeology first before we do that. So this is sort of going to be the format for our lectures. Um, I'll have some learning objectives and then some questions I'm going to want you to think about uh, while I go over the material. So this week um, I want you to have a basic understanding of archaeology as a discipline, um, understand chronology basics or how I'm going to approach chronology specifically in this course, mainly just for the sake of consistency, because different instructors in different realms of your life may use uh, chronology differently depending on what they're teaching, how they're teaching their own pasts, all of that. And then obviously the root of archaeology, I want you understanding the importance of context by the end of this lecture as well. So the questions I want you to think about you know, while we're going over this material. Why is it so important to study the past in any capacity, really? And is there a right or a wrong way to do it? You know, so just, just think about that while we move forward here. So archaeology. Archaeology comes from the word archaeos, uh, which means ancient. And associated with ology, it means the study of ancient things, or in a formal sense, the study of past societies specifically through the analysis of material culture. And that's what kind of separates archaeology from other disciplines such as history or something like that. Not saying that we don't use written materials when they're available, but in some instances, there is only the material culture that we have to try and paint a picture and understand what happened in the past. So how do we do that? The most common methodology for archaeologists is an excavation, usually preceded by a survey. So first you need to find the place and then you figure out where you want to dig and then you dig there. And obviously it's a very destructive thing, uh, but we do it meticulously, scientifically, to make sure that every piece is recorded properly and you get the, a full understanding of what you're digging into, which is the stratigraphy of the site. So at the very bottom, obviously, you have the oldest deposits. And then as people continue to live on the site, further settlements there and there and there until it stops. And then that is your top layer. And then usually it's covered in, who knows, farmland or something like that. But that's the stratigraphy that you go through. And usually you have to understand soil color and, you know, look at the different materials that are coming out of the various forms of stratigraphy. Um, it can get very complicated, but that's, it's a very meticulous thing. And that's how we preserve the past the best we can while also destroying it. So, well, it's a little harsh. But <laughs> I hope you understand what I mean by that. But obviously with... Um, technological advancements, um, especially in the modern age, we have less destructive ways of doing archaeology or understanding sites, especially. So we have, I think the coolest one is LIDAR, which is uh, light detection and radar, which is the use of lasers, pretty much uh, usually 
up in an airplane or something and it goes over a certain area and it scans that area, which is usually a very large area. Um, and it can show you, you know, what's there pretty much. And it's, it's uh, widely used in say Mesoamerica where you have very thick jungle canopy. So you can't just fly over and use your naked eye to see stuff or even ground walk really to try and find stuff. You have to, the LIDAR allows you to see where the sites are and pinpoint them. And then obviously using stuff like GIS, which is Geographic Information System, you can specifically pinpoint where that site is in relation to say, you know, the, the main site you do know about. Um, another good example is Stonehenge. Uh, they've done a lot of LIDAR around Stonehenge and they've, uh, A, the site is more extensive than they thought it was, and B, there's a whole bunch of other sites around it that weren't previously known that probably have a direct relationship with what Stonehenge was used for as well, which is obviously, especially in that context, very debatable because we don't have anyone writing things down back then telling us what it was used for. So we have to interpret based on what we find in the ground or what was standing, i.e. the stones. So what do we have, you know, to study the past other than just, you know, what you can see with the naked eye? Well, you have, when you start digging a site, you'll find everything. You'll find debitage, which is a very broad term or fancy term for garbage, detritus, so broken pottery, uh, uh, flint, like pieces of stone for making a stone tool, and or you'll find uh, bones and stuff as well. So there's a huge range of material that we're looking at and putting it all together to try and interpret what happened at individual sites, let alone like whole regions and during specific time periods. And it's, it's very, very interesting trying to discern that. But then also you have what is still in use today, which we'll get into next week. So buildings, for example, um, are the best example really of, you know, ancient things still in use today that you can see, that you can interpret, that have a history, just like any object you dig out of the ground. And then also there's this idea of heirlooms which is, you know, are still culturally relevant today, still in use culturally today. They're small objects usually, but they're also, you know, an integral part of a modern community. Um, but they were also used in, you know, ancient times. So it's this, it's a very flexible, fluid thing, uh, cultural heritage, archeology span in general. But as a discipline, you know, archeology, span takes all these pieces and tries to paint a picture of what happened. And you have to kind of interpret things sometimes and, you know, take yourself out of your modern mindset and look at an object, you know, objectively. So, but every piece of the past is very important. And, well, how far back does that past go? So human history itself is very long, well, sort of, <laughs> not in the history of the world as a whole, but uh, our early hominid ancestors, uh, that ranges back, I think 3.5 million years roughly, uh, in a broad sense. And we, in this course, are only going to be focusing on, you know, roughly 15,000 years ago. <laughs> Uh, not to say that, you know, architecture didn't exist, you know, millions, tens of thousands of years ago. I mean, it could be argued that, you know, caves were sort of the original form of architecture or people were too mobile to build anything that is still viable in the archaeological record today. So the focus of this course, obviously, is going to be what's called the Neolithic Revolution, which is kind of what a lot of scholars will argue is the onset of civilization, uh, where people became more sedentary and settled, and you start to see, you know, architecture, like more permanent architecture, um, agriculture, uh, everything associated with that, social hierarchy. You start to see a lot more of that in the ar archaeological record, and there's a lot more stuff compared to um, before that. 
And so in terms of labeling uh, time, in this course, I'm going to be using the terms BCE, which means before common era, and CE, common era. And those are the secular versions of BC and AD, which is usually the most common form of dating that you'll see. Um, but yeah, I'll be using BCE and CE. And so obviously the Neolithic Revolution, as you see on the slide, roughly 13,000 to 10,000 BCE. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit more. But chronology itself obviously is very complicated. And it differs across time and space. It differs across specific regions. Um, like my favorite example is the Iron Age. Uh, you have an Iron Age in Greece and you have an Iron Age in Great Britain. But the Iron Age in Greece ended, you know, a thousand years before the one in Britain did. You know, so it's, and they use it based on what you find, like material-wise in the archaeological record, which is understandable. But it can get kind of confusing if you're trying to study things more broadly, if you're just looking at, you know, this idea of the age. Um, so, but we'll get into that a little bit more uh, as we talk about our specific case studies. So archaeology, context. What is context? So it's the who, what, when, where, why, and how. It's the most important part of understanding what happened to everything ranging from the smallest pottery shard to the biggest church that's still in use today. You know, it's, it's so important to understand not only, you know, it's nice to know what was happening at the time. That's why, that's where written sources come in. But it's also, you know, important to understand because I mentioned stratigraphy before, where in the stratigraphy was this item found? You know, it was it part of this certain event. Why is it in this place? You know, and you'll see a lot of terms. So in terms of terminology, I have a couple on the slide here. So provenience and provenance. So provenance obviously will, is in more association with like works of art. That's the context where you'll see that a little bit more, but it is in some archaeological papers as well. And then you have provenience, which is pretty much the same thing, um, but uh, you see that more in archaeological uh, contexts. So it's pretty much just the origin of something. You know, it's history as an object. You know, where did it come from? Where, like, where was it found? And then also understanding, you know, what happened before that, you know, if you can get down to, you know, the nitty gritty and find out where was it made, what was it made from, you know, who made it. These are all the important things you want to try and understand about objects, buildings, anything in the archaeological record to try and paint a better picture of what happened in the past. And so another term you're going to see a lot is in situ. Uh, I might even use that at some points. Uh, throughout this course, which in its most basic terms means in the original place or its original deposition. So, you know, it's the best example is Pompeii, fairly well known. A lot of the stuff there is in situ um, and it also has a very, and it's easy to understand that context because, you know, everything was abandoned and buried so quickly. Um, that we have a really good understanding of that site, um, or at least the parts of the site that have been excavated thus far. So thinking about this, so why is context so important? And I want to kind of give a good example. I know I've just thrown a lot of terms at you, so I just want to just give you a, a very basic example of the importance of context. So you have two vessels. Uh, for, let's for the, say for the sake of simplicity, they're the same kind of vessel. And so the first one, although fragmented, um, <laughs> uh, was properly excavated at an archaeological site. Uh, it was found in a particular room uh, in association with other artifacts, uh, maybe even inscriptions if we're lucky. And it's telling us that uh, this building uh, was a house that belonged to a specific individual and that this room uh, was used for a specific purpose because of the other artifacts found in the stratigraphy along with this pot. 
And so we can date the artifact as well based on the preserved um, archaeo charred archaeobotanical remains found within the vessel. So then we can also discern exactly what was stored in it, maybe what it was used for, all of that. And so its context gives us the answer to all of the questions. Um, and this, so we learned from this object that it was traded from a specific group in a specific place at a specific time, and it was used as a luxury item for say like a merchant class or something like that, which might provide us with new insights uh, regarding A, other archeological sites with similar deposits that maybe don't have as much information. So it's, it, it creates a broader picture of the past for us, even though it's, you know, a broken pot in the dirt. So then on the opposite side, vessel number two, uh, we have a similar vessel, but it was purchased as a souvenir by, let's say, a, a dandy European man on his grand tour in the 1800s. And we might know maybe the country it came from, maybe even the city, uh, but all the other information the pot had is lost because it was cleaned, it was made to look aesthetically pleasing to the eye, uh, you know, something that people would want to look at, um, but every other piece of its context is completely gone. And, you know, but it looks good in the mansion, right? <laughs> and so here we go. So, and sadly, obviously, this is the fate of many artifacts in the archaeological record, um, because archaeology itself is a discipline. Uh, didn't get, you know, scientific and strict about how you approach a site until, uh, you know, the 1950s, maybe. So you have a lot. So again, going back to that puzzle, those some of those pieces, you know, have been taken by other people throughout history. And again, that's all the history of these objects, these places. It all kind of, it's all part of the past, but sometimes it's very frustrating as well. So that was lecture number one. Uh, it was a lot of information, <laughs> um, but again, if you need any clarifications or you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I just have a couple of reminders and looking forward. So I'm going to be posting the quiz on Wednesday and then um, additional materials um, I'll be posting on the 20th. Uh, just some extra resources and stuff like that. If any, or if anyone wanted to know more about a certain discipline in archaeology, I'll do my best to try and find accessible resources for that as well. And next week, we're going to be talking about the archaeology of architecture specifically. Uh, we'll look at an artifact versus a feature, which we kind of touched on already a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to look at the three F's for approaching architecture in the archaeological record. So form, function, and feeling. And then a quick overview of our case studies before we get into the actual case studies themselves. So here's my bibliography. These were the, uh, this was the one source I used <laughs> uh, for this lecture in particular. Uh, but I did, I want you all obviously to keep learning. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more, um, in a simplistic term about archaeology. Obviously, uh, the Safe Cultural Heritage Group has other resources on their website. They have their social media, as well as something called ArcTalk and other uh, online courses. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. That concludes our week one lecture. And again, uh, reach out if you have any questions. I'll do my best to get back to you. Thanks so much.